Well, we are very blessed to be joined this morning by a priest who is about to become a bishop, but not a bishop in the Roman Catholic Church. And he's here to tell us a little bit more about his life and uh, his church as well. Bishop-elect Francois Beirut, he joins us now, of the Melkite Greek Catholic Church, here to tell us a little bit more. Good morning, Bishop-elect. How are you? I'm doing very well, Gus. And yourself? Oh, th- better than I deserve, believe me. Way better than I deserve. Likewise. Yeah, listen. Hey, when I read about uh, when I read about your uh, election as the bishop elect for the Melkite Greek Catholic Church, I guess in America, right in in all of the U.S., uh, I was really fascinated because I think that oftentimes uh, many of our listeners, when we talk, even when we use the word Catholic, we think of the Roman Catholic Church because you know many folks uh, grew up and and uh, born and raised in the Roman Catholic Church. But there are actually many different Catholic churches, many of the Eastern Catholic churches, all of whom are in communion with Rome. So if you wouldn't mind starting off, telling us a little bit, first of all, about the Melkite Greek Catholic Church, maybe about a, a little bit about the history, and you know, kind of give us a primer on, on uh, your Catholic Church. Okay, great. Um, yeah, the irony of the word Catholic is it actually uh, means universal in Latin and also um, belonging to the whole in the Greek. So to have a whole, you need to have other parts. And so yeah. this is why the <laughs> Eastern Catholic churches are important. We're the other parts. And as uh, Pope St. John Paul II used to say, we need to learn how to breathe with our two lungs of the church. So uh, we, we, were, we are the ancient church of Antioch, and of course also Jerusalem. And so we're technically the, the native churches of early Christianity, but just like Jesus said, you must go out to the whole world and proclaim the good news. That's exactly what we have done. So there, there are now dioceses around the world wherever there are historical Melkites, but our church is not limited to those whose parents and grandparents were Melkites. We are truly evangelical in the sense of our church and our doors are open to everyone, uh, speaking English, speaking Spanish, speaking whatever language they speak. So we've uh, established over 50 parishes, missions, and outreaches in the United States, and hopefully that will, will grow. We use the Byzantine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. We also use the liturgy of St. Basil during Lent and uh, 10 times during the year. Um, basically, within the Catholic Church, there are five ritual families. There's the Roman, which is the largest, but then there is the Byzantine, to which we belong, and which also the Ukrainian Catholics, the Romanians, the Ruthenians, the Bulgarians, and a few others use. And then there are the, the, the Syriac, the Coptic, and the Armenian uh, liturgical families. And I like to break it up that way. Sometimes people break it up into like 23 Sioux-Eurus churches, which is, which is all good. But what unites all those churches of the East are the liturgical families, which they belong to. So that's kind of a brief uh, history of where we were from, where we are. And hopefully um, our goal is to bear witness to the apostolic tradition of Antioch in uh, the entire United States of America, um, the ancient roots of the church, but also relevant and applicable to our daily reality and our daily situation, drawing from the major contributions that the Eastern churches have given to all of Christianity, specifically the development of not only icons, but also the theology of icons, Mm. And also the East is where all the ecumenical councils, the early ecumenical councils were held, um, the development of the main theology of the liturgy, and so many other important elements that are not the heritage of a particular club or a group, which we are not. We are um, not even part of a church. We are um, the church as one in all these rites, and everybody contributes in both historical elements of the church, but also bearing witness to our faith today and uh, bridging to daily life in whatever whatever situation we're living in and find ourselves in. So for those who aren't familiar, if someone goes to a, a, a Roman Catholic church here in the U.S. and a typical, you know, Novus Ordo Catholic, Roman Catholic church here in the U.S., what would they find different if they were to go to a, a Melkite Catholic church and the liturgy there? Right. Um, the liturgy, we use the liturgy of St. As I said, most, of the, most Sundays we use the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. And initially when you walk in, there might not be some of the things that you, you may be used to seeing, but then there are also maybe other things that, you, that a Roman, Roman Catholic would, might be used to seeing. So you, you, you don't have a holy water at the entrance, but you have an icon, which we venerate, 
to, sim- to, to remind everybody that we are entering into sacred space and that we are all made in the image and likeness of God. And then icons tend to, depending how long a church has been around, and if it's a new church, then we'll, we'll have a few icons, but if a church is more developed and, uh, and uh, a, a larger community, then most often the entire church is filled with icons. Specifically, when you look to where the altar is, if the liturgy is, if the divine liturgy is not being celebrated, then there is a cover covering the altar that's called the royal doors, and then there's also a, a curtain that covers that, and the entire altar area is co- is covered by um, uh, an iconostas, which literally which means an icon screen. So once, so as soon as you walk in, you'll be really amazed by how beautiful the icons are. And the first and primary icon is the icon of Jesus Christ on the, on the right side of the royal doors. And then to Christ, Christ's right is an icon of the mother of God. And then to Christ's left, you'll find an icon of St. John Chrysostom, and then everything else fits in after that. So that's what you'll see in an Eastern Catholic church. And then when you attend the entire divine liturgy, you'll find some, some elements that are similar to the Roman Rite Mass, like, for example, petitions, um, offertories, but they are placed and done in slightly different ways. So we begin um, the Divine Liturgy with a series of petitions, and then we have petitions throughout. And those are set. They're, on, they're not changing petitions like uh, are found in, in a Roman Rite Mass. There are set liturgies which are deacon leads. And then the offertories are actually, in a sense, there are, there's an offertory and a procession that is done during the liturgy, the first one is called the little entrance, and that is the procession that the priest makes along with the servers, altar servers, from the altar. He walks around the entire uh, church, reminding people that the Word of God is among us, that Christ walked among his people, and then the epistle and the gospel are proclaimed. And then after that, there is, a, of course, a homily, but then the second part of the liturgy, sometimes called the Liturgy of the Eucharist, is where there is similar to what, it, what the Roman Rite calls the Offertory of the Gifts, and that is started also from a side altar, and the priest uh, actually prepares the, for the Divine Liturgy over an hour before the Divine Liturgy begins. He has prayers uh, before he enters the altar area, he has prayers of vesting, and then a very long prayer to prepare what we call the Holy Gift, the Eucharist, which we use leavened bread. And that is all prepared on the, on the left part of what we call the prophesis table. And every particle that we cut, we have special prayers, prayers for the dead, prayers for the living, prayers for the hierarchy, prayers for the saints. So all that is prepared in advance. And then uh, at that second part of the divine liturgy, the priest goes there and he, and he, and he carries the chalice and what we call the discos, which is what uh, the Roman Rite Patin, along with the deacon and the servers. And then, he does another procession, um, and that uh, leads him back to the altar, reminding us that Jesus walked to the cross, and the Eucharist is celebrated. The body and blood of Christ then is, is, uh, is distributed to all the people um, from that altar area, reminding us that the altar is both a table but also a tomb of Christ from where uh, Christ rose from the dead and proclaimed the good news to the whole world. So there are similarities on that. And, and, and so I like to think of it as uh, theology is very similar, sometimes nuances, different emphasis and nuances. Yeah. But uh, the, the way we practice it and the way we celebrate it is, is a little different. Yeah. And there's also an important note there that uh, these are not churches that split off from the Catholic Church. These are uh, in the early church, so it's the first 300 years, when, Saint, when, uh, when Jesus told the disciples, go into the whole world, they actually listened to him and did just that. Um, and wherever they went, they developed, um, they developed prayers based on local customs and, and traditions. They did not uh, waver in the faith, but the liturgy developed in different ways in different places up until there was, there was greater unity after the Council of, of Nicaea. So these were not seen in the church as splits or divisions. So when the fathers of the church gathered in Nicaea, they didn't say, oh, why is everybody doing things differently? They said, we have uh, a, a common belief, and we, we enunciate that in the, in the creed. However, there are a variety of different ways 
of expressing this one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Sure, and uh, and yet all of the so, churches are in communion with Rome and with the Bishop of Rome, the Holy right. Father, yes. Correct, he, exactly. He, he will soon be the uh, Bishop of the Melkite Catholic Church in the U.S., uh, Bishop-elect Francois Beirudi is with us here this morning. So tell us a little bit about yourself then and about your uh, your spiritual journey and especially your vocation to the priesthood. If I'm not mistaken, I detect sure. a Canadian accent. You do. I did. <laughs> you detect several accents in there, maybe. I was born in Lebanon, and we, we immigrated to Canada when I was five years old. We left due to the war. Uh, our house was bombed, and we got robbed, and the war wow. started um, getting more serious. And so my dad was visionary in a sense of knowing that things were not gonna were not gonna get better anytime soon. So we packed up our belongings. We headed down to the port of Juni, and we took a, a boat the next day, not a boat, a little barge really, um, to Cyprus, and then made our way to Greece. Spent six months there, did our paperwork to immigrate to Canada. And uh, my dad wanted somewhere, you know, the nostalgia of uh, of of those who leave there. Their, their home countries. Uh, so my dad wanted something as close to Lebanon as, as humanly possible. So he found Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and we ended up there near the mountains with the water surrounding us. And uh, then I went to Catholic elementary and high schools. And during uh, high school, started discerning a vocation to the priesthood, um, just started growing in my faith. Um, always attended the, we always attended the uh, uh, either the, the the Roman Rite Mass or the Melkite Divine Liturgy on Sunday, depending uh, you know what, what what day it was, because the Melkite Church was a little further, and sometimes uh, you know we attended a Roman Rite Mass. So I'm very familiar with the Roman Rite, and then um, my my prayer life started to grow, and started trying to trying to think of trying to discern where where what God wanted me to do, and then I you know I was very I was very blessed to have good good priests around me who directed me to the Seminary of Christ the King in, Brit- in British Columbia, in Mission, British Columbia. It's, uh, it's a seminary open to all dioceses and all from any, anywhere around the world, but it's run by the Benedictines, so it's not a diocesan seminary or a religious seminary, and they have a high school seminary, college seminary, and theology. So for a lot of uh, young guys, it was a place to go to discern vocations before making a commitment to a particular diocese. If some if some had not quite made it or religious order, so that's where I did my Bachelor of Arts, and I think what's called today pre theology. So you know, study philosophy and history, and uh, have a solid prayer life. Of uh, we joined the monastic community for most of the prayers, and we had prayers on our own. And then uh, during that time, uh, I really began to uh, prepare myself for theology and where I would go for theology, because as, as an Eastern Catholic. Although we believe the same things, we need to be trained in our own in our own background and our own liturgical tradition, like the divine liturgy, the theology, the fathers of the church, and things that are particular for our Eastern Catholic churches. So I ended up go, uh, first studying actually summer programs at a monastery in Northern California, run through this the Sheptitsky Institute of Eastern Christian Studies, and then and then I went to Ottawa, where I uh, did my degree in theology, um, in Eastern Christian studies, and then lived at, at the Melkite Parish, and then continued on to do uh, master's and a licentiate in scripture. And then after being ordained, I did a, uh, a PhD in scripture as well. Uh, God, through God's grace, he led me to America, uh, to California. And as, as I was preparing myself to leave, I said, God's got a good sense of humor. <laughs> I was sad to leave Ottawa, but uh, but now I'm going from um, half the year in cold weather to um, a place where it, it barely ever rains. So yeah. uh, spent, I've spent around 10 years in Orange County, in California, and this last Saturday, um, the announcement was made that I'll be the next bishop. So now I'm going to be moving to Boston, but also have a responsibility over all the Melkite Catholic parishes around the United States. And we also yeah. have a cathedral in California, so between the two. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, as as Roman Catholics we understand dioceses and and yours would be an eparchy, but your eparchy is the entire United States. So h- how how is that going to be for you? I mean, that's got to be quite a job in covering the entire US. Yeah, it's uh, it's massive like just even last week when I when I heard the announcement I came to Boston for for the announcement and um 
I thought, okay, so I got the book of flight and spent all day traveling. <laughs> oh, <laughs> boy. It was gone, just, just being on a plane just to, just to come for an announcement in a different area. But I think with everything else, God gives the grace. God gives the power. God gives the direction. Sure. And um, I feel, let me say, are you excited? I think I'm just more grounded right now in prayer and realizing that this is not a human task that I, it's not something that I'm, it's not like a marathon or, or, or a sprint or a triathlon. Yeah. It's something that only God can make possible. But also the role of the bishop is not to be doing like absolutely everything, operate, you know, operating every single minute detail. I see myself as first primarily journeying with the priest and the lay people in, in, in our journey of faith. So we have wonderful priests in all our parishes. We have wonderful deacons. We have wonderful lay people. And now it's a matter of uh, strengthening our communities and me being their father uh, of, of faith and, and leading the direction of the diocese. And most importantly, it's really my, my role is to pray for them and to, to have, to have a, a role of a teacher, teacher yeah. and guidance and, and a unifying role of bringing our parishes together that are spread out through different states that might have different mindsets and might have sure. different backgrounds and might have everything else. Different. Yeah. So, I'm sure. And I'm yeah, sure that you will. It's, I, it's, I, it's God's task. <laughs> amen. And, and I was very excited when I, when I heard the news, I, I have to run, but uh, please, I hope you'll come back on and let us know how things are going for you. I would love to. The Great. Or, ordination will be in our cathedral in North Hollywood, California on October the 12th at two o'clock. And then the uh, the enthronement, which uh, some Roman Catholic diocese call the, call the installation, we call it the enthronement, will be at our cathedral in Boston, at West Roxbury, Rosendale area, um, and that is going to be on the twenty the, the 19th, Great. October well, 19th, uh, both at 2 p.m. Well, be assured of our prayers. Bishop-elect Francois Beirudi of the Melchite Catholic Church in the U.S. I'm Gus Lloyd. More Seize the Day coming up here on the Catholic Channel. <laughs> 